Greetings, salutations to our podcast audience. Hello, How's everybody yes. doing? Hello, everyone. Ed, Nathan, y'all doing okay? I am. I'm doing, I'm doing good. Good. I'm doing good, good. Good. The podcast audience won't know this, but we're we're early today because the Braves are playing. That's right, and I'm yeah. pretty pumped. Yeah. yeah, Braves actually won a playoff series and uh, are moving on. Yes, oh, we hope they're go. moving on after this. Again, moving they on. should. They should move is on. Is this the first game of the next series? It Today is. will Today. be the first. So there this is go. Tuesday that we're taping. We as soon as we wrap Tuesday. this up, uh, we will be heading. So that some direction. of y'all will know. I predict a win today. Really? Who are who are who are, who are the Braves playing? We're Marlins. playing the Marlins. All right. Marlins. Yep. Is this is this like? I don't get. They don't call them conferences, right? In uh, they, we are in the like same a, division. Yeah. So the same. So this is a division. No, it's just really. all the different this year. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's, it's just that right. one of the. So this doesn't determine who goes to World Series. That's what I'm trying not to get. Yet. This is not, not a two rounds away from that. Yes. Okay. Or two yes. rounds. How away many from rounds that. are there in baseball? Well, players? normally there are only three. For three. There were four, but there are more this year. Oh, okay. I already feel like the NBA playoffs are long enough. NBA they is the only thing I yep. watch. And well, they're trying to like keep up. Baseball's getting even longer. Baseball's trying to keep up. We let half the games. How many games you have to win to win a series? This one five. You have to win. You have three. to win. You have to win three of five. Oh. You have to win three of five. This okay. this round is five games. That's better. Every you got to win four in the NBA. Three, though. The first was oh two. yeah. See that's how that's how the NBA should be. The NBA does well, four. You back have to in win. my day, the NBA did have a first round. Those two out of three. Oh okay. Because yeah. but money drives everything. Yeah. So you got to have more games. Have more games. It. Yes, sir. All right. So you're predicting a win. I'm, I'm predicting a win. I hope that's uh, hope for that's the whole series for sure. I'm just going to go ahead and say today too. But the listeners will know by this time whether I was right or not. Yeah. Oh, you want to go for the whole series? I, we're definitely going to win the series. We're going to win how many games? I think we're – it. Uh, I'm going to say four. All right. We got him on the record. I'm going to say four. He is on the record. Say four we're games and four. four. Braves okay. and four. All right. So, by this, by the next podcast, we, we will. Should know. We should be in the next round, I predict, with the Dodgers. Uh, yeah, I would have predicted that as well. Okay. There you go. All right. Well, uh, let's. Uh, I think they're going to win in five. You think the oh, Dodgers the are going to win? The win. Dodgers are going to oh. have to play all five. Ah, okay, okay. I may be wrong. Want to keep going with your predictions, or you want? No. Okay. All right. We'll just stop there. All right. You've heard it from Ed. Let's hope he. I guess I hope he's right for at least the race. <laughs> yeah. I don't care about the Dodgers. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, question from our virtual lobby. As we virtual do, lobby. Does it have anything to do with baseball? No. Maybe you go. Oh, oh, that is true. Okay, I was going to say. Otherwise, I don't really care. There was Maybe. a question that sort of lent <laughs> this first question. Might you might be it might be about baseball. What's the best gig slash social event slash game you ever attended? So, oh. so I answered this question in uh, our virtual lobby. I was talking with my my good friend Donnie Dorsey in the in the virtual lobby, which was this quite week. entertaining. I just have to yeah, say. okay. I well, watched that. You. It was thank good. You. Entertaining. Yeah, I thought uh, Donnie. I, I always, also thought it was entertaining with yeah. him and Donnie. I like I, uh, Donnie's got good stuff. Donnie's answer I thought was a great one. He got to see Allen Iverson play uh, when he played for the Sixers, and uh, Allen Iverson w- would have been uh, fun to get to see yes. in his prime. So uh, that was his. Mine was I believe I said uh, we went and saw Lincoln Park in concert, and uh, that was. That was pretty wonderful. So that was nice. Those are that was mine. As a as a true metalhead, I have to laugh at you. Oh, I understand. <laughs> I understand. I understand that. Because Lincoln Park is what we metalheads make fun of. Oh, I understand that. But that's okay. That's but but I, they they were they were great back in the day. I yes. will say I enjoyed Lincoln Park. Back They're not the bad. I, I have to I have to admit. Not it's not true metal. Not true not metal. True. New metal with a U. Yeah, that's the part. That's the kind that metalheads look down on. Yes. You know, yes. But that's just because they're, you know, everybody in music's looking down. They on got, that's right. <laughs> gotta have somebody <laughs> to look down. It's on. usually down. whoever gets paid. So Probably, yeah. Paid. Well, you so resent the ones that are getting. All I'll answer my favorite concert, which will, you know, be a surprise this to some people. Fun. And this is a part of looking down too. And mm-hmm. that my favorite all-time concert, which mm-hmm. does not fit my genre. Mm-hmm. I, as you all well know, I don't like country music. Yeah. Mm-hmm. My favorite concert's Willie Nelson. Wow. Mm-hmm. I saw Willie Nelson. <laughs> As a replacement concert for Leonard Skinner, I had tickets hmm. to Leonard Skinner. They were supposed to be uh, in my area uh, the week after they crashed, mm-hmm. and so we got our money back, and we were determined to go to a concert. <laughs> 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 and so Willie Nelson was there, and we went and saw Willie, and wow. it was th- it was by far the best concert I've ever been to. Well, to take up for your comment, and this is this is again looking down on certain styles of music. Compared to what now is called country, he ain't country. 
No, no that's, that's for sure. So I'll say that. The and w- that concert for sure was not. Yeah. The worst concert I've ever been to was, and this will probably upset everyone in the in the South, we got free tickets somehow. I don't remember how I got free tickets. I think it was at Lakewood, or it might have been Verizon Wireless. We went and saw uh, Jason Aldean and mm. uh, Florida Georgia Line Ugh. and somebody else who's pretty Ugh. popular in country. I remember when you went to that concert. Yeah, That's, me and mm. uh, my older brother John, his wife Sarah, and my wife Jennifer, we all went. <laughs> and uh, John, I think, liked one of the bands, which is why we ended up going. But none of us paid for the tickets, which is why I went, because I love live music. Sure. And I was like, I'm sure it won't be terrible. It was by it was, far the worst concert. Mm-hmm. And not because the people weren't that great. I'll say this. Everyone who's like, you shouldn't go to a hip-hop concert. That's a rowdy crowd. Uh, I've been to hip-hop concerts. I've been to metal concerts. Yep. I've been to, there ain't never been a crowd I felt more unsafe in than a country crowd. I believe Those it. people had pre-gamed alcoholically <laughs> yes. uh, coming to the game. I felt yes. unsafe for them. I felt yes. unsafe for me. I felt unsafe for everybody. It was a bad time. And I'll uh, say, as a guy who's been to many metal shows, those are some of the best crowds. Because people ever been are in. into the music. They're oh, there for yeah. the music. We're At music the concert nerds. I went to, no one was there for no, the music. No, no. <laughs> even, even the people that are in the mosh pit, yes. they're some of the nicest folks you ever want to be around. They're, 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 they're really concerned about your safety and that yep. you have a good time. <laughs> they're just good it's people. It's been the same. Any, any hip-hop show I've ever been to has been the exact same way. People are there for the music. I'll say this. Out of everything we've said lately that uh, people are, are going to get upset about, this may be the one that gets yeah. people really upset. The when country we, music going fans. Going at country music fans. We might lose some people over yeah. there. Okay. That's okay. Country music. Ugh. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, that. that might really get some people going. All you Jason Aldean fans out there coming yes. at coming at me. Uh, but I just remember, I do remember some people slow dancing to uh, Big Green Tractor by Jason Aldean, <laughs> which if you haven't heard, I just thought, did people legitimately slow dance to this song? But I mean, yes. somebody, somebody. I just want to say, that's the most cliched country thing <laughs> ever. I didn't even know that was a song. Yes. Oh, yeah. There's yes. a song called, called Big, Big Green, Green something, Tractor. Something Something on right. my big green tractor. Okay, something something and, faster. And it's, and it's a song you slow dance to. Well, it's kind of like a <laughs> yeah, laid back I think he's inviting his girlfriend to ride on it. Ride on the big green tractor. I have heard this song. Before. Yeah, it's you know, I don't I don't get I don't get what's going uh, on. But some of y- some of y'all are like, I have my first kiss to big green <laughs> tractor, and Nathan's making fun of it, and I don't like it. It's the most cliche thing ever. It was it was bad. I but I you know somebody made some magical memories you know that they that won't you wrote forget that by putting that into the computer country music generator. Oh that's yeah, all it yeah. <laughs> it's called Nashville. Yes, they just put it. All in. right, <laughs> now that we've all made enemies, I, I, I'm I'm going to skip to the next question. What is your biggest pet peeve in traffic? All right, once again, I'll go first. What y'all think? Because I've already answered this. Uh, mine is not necessarily what other people do. Um, but uh, outside of I my I saw vehicle. yours in the lobby. Oh, you saw mine, yes. My my wife, and we just had this because this weekend we were on vacation and we mm-hmm. drove to Myrtle Beach and drove back, and so going through Atlanta traffic and constantly uh, having to hear, oh, mm-mm, they're breaking, they're breaking about 150 feet ahead of me, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. and having More to, than that. Yeah, more than that. <laughs> or, or just, you know, because once again, driving through Atlanta traffic, people – who I don't even have to break for. They're just swerving directly in front of me, and somehow that was my fault that they yep, swerved yeah. in front of me. So uh, anyway, my wife this time just said, yeah, I'm just going to I'm just gonna go to sleep, which she didn't go to sleep. No, they but don't. She, they never she do. She promised to go to sleep, and she didn't. So, I, You know, I used to think that was a universal husband-wife thing, but I have a really good friend who is a male. Mm-hmm. That's him oh, all oh, the funny. time. Really. With, with, when, his, with his wife. With anyone oh, when he is not driving. Gotcha. Uh, that's a control problem. Yes. I also have said that. That's yeah. what I think. Uh, when he is not driving, he must... We, we should put a bag over his head. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to say it, but unfortunately... You and I are on the same page. There you go. My wife is the same way, but she has a a patented noise that oh, she makes, and it's hers, and it and and it's it's and it's a it's the sound that people make in like horror movies, that, <laughs> which always scares me. Yes, it's something it's to the to the effect of <gasps> like yes. that. And when she does it, I do that inside, yes. and I jump, and then I start looking around. I do the fight or flight thing. I yes. look around. I go, what, what, what? And then she goes, yeah. Oh, that car just put the brakes on. And I'm like. You know, and 
I, yeah. And then, and then I'm all. Then I've got the adrenaline going. Yeah. So now I'm, I'm really ticked. An off. argument begins. Then an argument starts, and which brings us to this week's series that will be starting. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> triggered. Ad, triggered. That's you right. Got, you got triggered. I got triggered. <laughs> this, this week I was driving, and uh, w- one of my daughters is in the back seat and goes. <gasps> Yeah, I'm sorry. That probably was terrible on the mic, but yeah, screams like that. And I said, "What?" And she goes, "Spider, spider!" And I said, "Do not scream when there's a spider in the car." It wasn't in the car. I saw it on a tree outside. <laughs> and I said, "Well, then definitely don't scream if you see it, in the, you know, because I jerked the car. Not that hard. We would have flipped, but yes. you know what I mean. Mm. So, so there you Becky's go. is similar to that. So we've had that same issue. Becky has gotten significantly better as we, you know, 40 years. She's better, mm. but. The one that's been with her the whole time is she doesn't see well at night. Ah. Mm. And yet she wants to control the car mm. when she can't see well. Mm. It has caused many arguments of, ah, I go, what's wrong? Well, I don't really know what's happening. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so all I'll say about this question is I, I hope our wives don't listen to the podcast. I know for sure my wife doesn't listen to this podcast. Mine doesn't and either. I also she know attends my in wife person. Does not listen to this so <laughs> what does that say for the people who do? Our own wives don't listen to this. <laughs> Yeah, you can tell them what we uh, said. Probably like, can't. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> that's what my wife was yeah. like. <laughs> that's why I don't listen. I to don't it. listen to it. I assume he I talks bad to about me all the time. Or I'm, I listen to you all the time. Why do I want an extra <laughs> hour? Why do I want to listen that? Which I totally can I sympathize with. I, understand. I understand completely. I also don't listen to this podcast, no. <laughs> <laughs> so that's okay with me. Well, you were you, involved in it. Why were you? That's right. To I don't need to go back and hear it. So, all right, now on to questions that people actually want to hear the answers to. I do want to say this is a fine drink if you have it. <laughs> sun-kissed diet, sun-kissed orange. We, it is pretty good. We have these. Is this, is, this is a this week thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you never song. know what you're going to get. It's, it's the like CCC limited fridge. edition <laughs> drinks now. CCC <laughs> fridge. Because of the aluminum shortage. <laughs> yeah. Who knew? So, But uh, like I said. COVID is killing aluminum. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> Who wouldn't talk? All right. Uh, listener questions. We, we did have some turned oh, in this week. Some good. people. Uh, one, I'm not sure is it completely serious, but. We'll, we'll throw it out there and see what y'all have to say about it. We will answer it. Seriously. We will answer it. Seriously. Well, maybe. <laughs> uh, here's, the, here's a question. You mention sponsor a podcast often. What does that mean, <laughs> and what does it entail? Oh, oh, that does sound like a very serious question. Yeah, it does, and probably one we should have thought through beforehand, but let's go into it right now. Yeah, jump right in. I think Honestly, should... most often what we mean, I think I'm usually the one that says it, most often I just mean it as a joke. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, that's right. But there, but there are actual sp- uh, podcast sponsors and there such are. like that, so if, if you want answers on that, I'm well, sure and other people I would, can. Well, and I would just like to speak seriously on the subject. This is really a, a question for our manager, Joel. <laughs> yes. And you should probably just reach out to Joel oh, and ask man. him, how do you go about sponsoring the podcast? What <laughs> benefits do you get right. from it? Yeah, get the Joel. We need Joel to get some kickbacks. The main thing we would want to know is what benefits do we get? Yes. <laughs> yes, that's right. yes. That's you, right. And, and here's the thing it, it's not a very high bar to jump over because, you know, we pretty much take anything. Oh, we yeah. got free food. We, we got, got free food. food. And not food not and that we it was super, bad. It was no, amazing. It was really good. No. We were happy with it. But we and, were so excited. He, just we did not vet it, though, beforehand. No. We did not go into the into the company's personal no. ethics or business ethics. It was or, here. Yeah, but so I'm going to say, it. just to push him out of the way, we might have to, you got to have a conversation with Joel. So email Joel. There you at go. Joel at community-christian.net. There you go. There you go. I like that. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> and maybe you could sponsor. You could sponsor. Maybe you could sponsor. We could sponsor. I don't know what you want to give us, but we'll we, take it. If you like bought a star, you know, you could like buy stars in the sky. <laughs> buy a star, name it the Community Christian Anywhere podcast, mm. and we'll, we'll we can do that. That'd be a thing. I don't know what else. We could do all kinds of stuff. That's a really good question. I like, that. I like that question. You like that? Okay. So I, I hope that was a good answer. Here's the other one, and this one is more serious. So, can we can we be serious? For okay. Nope. Having not pr- prepared at all for this, okay. it's going right. to be tough. Well, so, mm. here we go. Why do you think so many Christian churches choose not to do communion each week, as opposed to what we do at Community Christian? We actually observe communion every single Sunday. They would like to know why other churches don't. I, you know, I think you'd probably get a better answer by asking them. I can yes, tell you why we so. do. Mm-hmm. Yes. I can tell you the reasons I've heard from people why mm-hmm. they don't. But, you know, you honestly should ask other 
somebody who doesn't what their <laughs> their answer is. I yeah, think. I, would, I would agree with that. Because I can they, they would not have chosen any of the three of us to be their spokesman. No, That's and, right. and they have and they have thoughtfully and prayerfully um, yes. considered their reason yes. to do it, just as we have thoughtfully and prayerfully considered ours. So yeah, no we, one, I don't believe there are any churches that have the tradition surrounding communion that went into it and goes, you know, I know what the Bible says. I'm going to do this instead. That's right. right. <laughs> yes. That's right. Yeah. Most often it's just we're, we're interpreting it or understanding it differently. And, mm-hmm. But all of us are trying to follow Jesus and yes. trying to follow the commands. We just don't all necessarily yes. yeah. agree on the same thing. And, it, and it's another one of those issues because of what all you guys just said is it's another one of those issues that we can see differently mm-hmm. and yet still not divide over necessarily. Yeah, and unfortunately, it has been that kind of thing, yes. I would say, yes. particularly with communion, because you may not know this if you've only been a community Christian, but even within churches that take it every week, mm-hmm. in my lifetime, there have been ways that you take it every right. week. Like the way we do it at Community Christian, there would be people that would consider the way we do it yeah. to be so antithetical to what God would mm-hmm. want that they would not continue to come to church here. Mm-hmm. Uh, just to give you an example, of people that would agree with us, it should be every week. Uh, they would believe, you know, that only an ordained person should handle the right. elements mm-hmm. and that you shouldn't touch it in any way. Yeah. Uh, or if they believe other people can handle it, it should be people who have reached some standard, like an elder, mm-hmm. they should handle it. Or there are people that believe there can't be a division of the cup or a division yep. of the bread, that those elements themselves have to be a single cup. Mm-hmm. And so it's sad that we've taken something. <laughs> that was meant to unify. It was meant to be a unifying thing that we remember Jesus and we've allowed it to divide because... Uh, but that's the way different. everything is. It is the way everything Every is. single thing that has divided the church... Uh, universally was never meant it was because that, that wasn't Jesus's intent we were all supposed to be one and we yeah. picked these things as th- this is a non-negotiable I'm going to die on this hill and if you can't change to be the way I want I'm going over here and that that was never the intention mm-hmm. and it doesn't mean that Jesus didn't have a singular intent but if he on some of these things that it clearly is not clear enough that everybody can agree, Mm -hmm. uh, he probably, (laughs) the singular intent that he might have meant at the time might not have mattered as much as we would like it to. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not saying that Jesus was just saying, I'm going to leave this as open as I can. It just may mean it just doesn't, it wasn't as important to him as we want to make it. I just same. don't. I just don't think it's in the character of God, having seen Him in the person of Jesus, to when we, you know, finally do see Him face to face, He's going to go, <laughs> "Gotcha." Exactly. You know, there was that thing that I really didn't make clear, but you didn't get it right, and therefore, you know, somehow you're in the wrong. Well, Parti- and certainly, we all understand that we, you know, even even at our church where we have a reason we do it the way we do, we all understand we are not taking communion in the way that Jesus or the first church. Oh, would have no, would have not. done it. It's it's in a different setting. It's in a different environment. The elements themselves are a little different. We have chosen you know mm-hmm. different kind of things. So even among those things, as you said, it's not a it's it is symbolic by its nature. And there's this there's this mm-hmm. when we talked about. And I think we've answered this. So someone can tell me we've answered before about sacraments, right? Because I remember about talking that. about that. Mm-hmm. So even by yeah. the nature of sacraments, yeah. you're taking ordinary elements, and by the meaning that you're imbuing to them, that makes them sacred. Yes. And right. so that's the nature of it. And so uh, anyway, yes, I agree. We, we we will divide over anything that we can divide over, which that's we've amazing. been talking about many times on this podcast. Yeah, the, the heart, again, it, it's hard for us to miss. And what's interesting to me is all of this and of... There are some things Jesus is really clear on. Like, it's hard to read John 17 and not see that Jesus really, really, really wants his people to remain one, Mm -hmm. to remain united. And yet we've chosen all kinds of ways to say, yeah, but if he had understood how important this was, it would be worth not being one over. Sure. And I Mm -hmm. just recently heard this, and I thought, you know, here's your Dallas Willard one. I'd never heard this one before, but it was... 
uh, a quote, and I think you guys listen to us. This may not have been that podcast, so I don't know. You guys can tell me. But there's a podcast of someone who's a student of Dallas Willard, and they said, it's when we disagree on something, that's yep. absolutely the wrong time to divide. Yes. yes. That that's the most important time to draw near to one another. And, and and I would say all of us, I know this is not an answer, so this probably, once again, gets, I would think all of us would say probably the biggest areas of growth in my life have come when I've disagreed with someone else. Mm-hmm. That it's in that moment where either I'm not saying that I've always gone, Oh, I was totally wrong. Often it's in the way that I handled correcting somebody and telling the truth. But often it's been, I said, you're so wrong. This is so dumb. But because I refused to back away from the relationship, Mm -hmm. I did correct my thinking and I did correct my behavior or I corrected something. And so, so often, and this doesn't escape the church, Human beings in our relationships, when there's any discomfort, any conflict, we just want to pull away and walk away, mm-hmm. and we don't grow because of that. Yep. Uh, we're stunted in our growth, and so yep. that happens in the church just as much. So so, even in every one of those instances you talked about, Nathan, even if the only growth that happened in that encounter was that I learned better how to love an enemy, sure, yeah, yeah, growth yeah absolutely. took place. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, which, or how which to speak is something the truth. most of us never learn. Mm-hmm. We think I've got to convert an enemy into a friend, or I've yes. got to, you know, weaken what I thought for the sake of this. Yeah. There is a way to love somebody without ever them changing or me changing. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, all right. On to Sunday. Uh, this past week, we uh, wrapped up the Voices series. We mm-hmm. heard from. Two really smart dudes. Yeah. That was one thing that hit me while we were listening to that interview. I was like, both of these guys are really smarter than me. Yes. Even more than most people are smarter than me. <laughs> these guys are really smarter well, than the me. The other thing that came out, and I had a, a really in in a uh, person who has a lot of intuition about spiritual <laughs> life in our congregation say to me afterwards about one of the two, he said, he's not only really smart, he comes off as being humble yeah. yes. and smart and I said to him, I've seldom met a person who's really smart (laughs) who also doesn't have a lot of humility. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people that really think they're really smart, and myself included in that often, Mm -hmm. who don't have a lot of humility. Mm -hmm. Yes. So they talked to us about the the intersection of science and faith. And Mm -hmm. um, so the first question that I thought we would wrestle with a little bit is, why do you think that's true of most Christians? Why, why, do, why do we see that within the church so much that we tend to want to pit science and faith against one another? What did, what, where does that instinct in us, because I think maybe some people feel as if it has to be that way. I think because I, the places I have seen it most often in me when I thought there was a conflict and in other people when I wind up talking to them is because they're trying to use one discipline to answer a question that the other discipline should be answering, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. They're trying to use a scientific method to answer a philosophical question, mm-hmm. which is not possible, mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. to use philosophy to answer a scientific, scientific question. question. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think a lot of where it comes down to, and I think this is on both sides, but I'll just talk about the religious side here, is I think um, both of those carry so much cultural power or they used to and he and, and uh, dr keller spoke to this a little bit in in his answer but they both carry a lot of cultural power what that what i mean by that is um there, there there's a lot of influence and a lot of sway uh, not as much i'll say on the religion part in america as it probably was at some point but that is held by being hey we have the answers you can mm-hmm. come to us for answers mm-hmm. we're the ones who have the answers you can come to us and so that tempts us to step into things that we necessarily don't have the answer for because that's not the kind of answers we're trying to get and and vice versa on the other side and so and even if you hear this stuff i, I watch a lot of nature documentaries with my, my daughters because they're very interested in science and the natural world and all that kind of stuff and so we watch a bunch and i was watching one about space the other day and the person who hosting it is an atheist and by the nature of of what they're teaching, they get into uh, church and, Hmm. uh, you know, and so very much into Galileo and how the church handled that and all this kind And so they're very much pitting. It was science versus Mm -hmm. religion. And even in there, that really is the birth of a lot of this with the Enlightenment in uh, Western Europe, which influenced so much of what America is, comes out of the Enlightenment. And a lot of that was 
science coming in and going, hey, we have all the answers. You don't need church anymore because mm-hmm. that's effectively what this show was getting to is mm-hmm. science has now outgrown church. You don't need that anymore because they mm-hmm. were answering questions, but that was all superstition, as you said, mm-hmm. not answering the same questions, but that didn't matter. There's And he talked about scientism yep. on Sunday, that there's this that's kind right. of scientism of, well, if that's what science says, which is very similar to – I've because once again, I talk to a lot of young people who are going to college for the first time. There is a very religious way that science is spoken about, especially in university settings oh, yeah. and places mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. that. That is very similar to the Bible says it, that settles it. Their mm-hmm. answer often is, well, that's what science says, as if there's mm-hmm. one science book that <laughs> explains everything. Science says it, that settles it. And both sides, it's a way, in my opinion, to gain cultural power of you can trust us. We have ultimate truth. We have ultimate this. But the but the church, as you said, if we're stepping into truth in areas that that's not the kind of truth we're trying to lead people to, we're leading them to God, who he is ultimate truth. Right. He yeah. has all truth. And so any scientific claim that gets proven as true is going to point back to God. It's never mm-hmm. going to disprove God. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so we don't have to be afraid because when we get afraid, the fear is, well, what if people stop trusting in us and now we got this? And same difference. I, I believe there are those in the sides. scientific on community that That's are also right. going, oh, it, they, they'll, they'll stop trusting in us, and it's on both sides of the issue. But I think that's the religious part is we often get afraid mm-hmm. science is somehow going to disprove yeah. what we believe. It's when you feel threatened, and that's what I've seen, yeah. the reaction on, on both sides, but particularly because I'm on this side of the church, and I've seen a mm-hmm. lot of Christians that I think they get real fearful and they think, well, we're going to lose something, or you know, and, and, and I often want to go, well, if you really are going to lose something, then maybe what you were putting your hope in is not right. very solid. You know? right. So don't, don't, like you just said, don't well, fear it's, truth. It's, it's like after we had near-death experience when we were talking about that a few weeks ago, mm-hmm. and somebody said, I'm not sure I buy all that, and what if it comes out all that was a hoax? What will that do to your faith? And yeah. I go, it won't do anything to Nothing. my faith Nothing. because I wasn't basing my faith right. on what right. these people had to say. Mm-hmm. I, I based my faith on what one guy, what happened in history mm-hmm. when he stepped out of the grave alive and the movement that came out of that, mm-hmm. not out of this one thing. Absolutely. Uh, do I admit that if the resurrection were proven <laughs> untrue, that it would shake my faith? Yeah, yeah. my whole faith mm-hmm. is built on that one thing. Well, and I think it's built yeah. on that. I think the scriptures are very make that very clear. Yeah, Paul, Paul yeah. said that. that. Paul said that. If Jesus is not raised, your faith's in vain. Go do something else. But whether Genesis one is literal seven days or it's not literal seven days, Mm-mm. doesn't shake my faith no. at all. The Bible. I mean, honestly, I know enough about the Bible. The Bible's not trying to make that claim. Nope. It, could that be? Maybe it is. Science, that, that's not what we're trying to do. The Bible's not trying to do science. Nope. It's not. Nope. So none of that shakes my faith. It's, so anyway, <laughs> that's what I would say about that. I agree. I have noticed, I will say on this, you were talking about the fear thing, and I feel for this, and I do think it's a danger in our world. I think we're, and I just I started, I read a synopsis of a book that I've now ordered that I haven't, you know, I love books, so... I haven't started reading, and it's along the line of that we're into an anti-authority uh, authorities age. Oh. That everything in our age, that if you're an authority, we don't want to hear from authorities. Oh, I want right. to discover things for myself. Yes. Yeah. So I w- I've watched during in our pandemic as people just go, well, you can't trust science. Right. Well, <laughs> we're in a lot of trouble if you can't trust science. I mean, you're going to have a hard time dealing with the gas in your house. You're going to have a hard time yep. if you uh, doing with your your car. All of that. If you don't trust science, you you <laughs> got a do lot. Do people really mean what? No, that they when don't they say it. They mean they on this thing. Right. I don't want to hear what they have to say. Exactly. And then I've watched people I know that are on the science side. Friends of mine that are Christians and mm-hmm. scientists who work you know, for organizations that they feel threatened. So they're trying mm-hmm. to pump back up science like, mm-hmm. well, there's, there, truth can't be threatened. Right. That's right. I mean, it's just true. Mm-hmm. It, it can't. So the fact that you don't buy it, I mean, again, I uh, I love Dallas. Again, Dallas, uh, Dallas Willard who used to say, reality is, uh, 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 oh, I'm going to miss. Say, what you bump up against. It's what you bump up, up against. Say it. Find out that you were wrong. Yes, that's right. Mm-hmm. Reality is what you bump up against when you find out that you're wrong. And what that means is, I didn't think this scientific thing was true. And then all of a sudden, lo and behold, I got COVID. Yeah. yeah. Here we go. <laughs> and, uh, oh, I have learned a lot. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and it's, it's interesting when you find someone who's, you know, 
was denying something at one point, and then they have an experience. Yes. And then it changes everything. Yeah. You know, and, and, and that's usually the difference. And that's like you said, you bump into reality. Well, and I think, though, that goes to back to what we were talking about even earlier. So both on science and faith part, um, the reason I think it holds – the reason we're so threatened by it is – Ultimately, and I think this also goes back to a lot of the alignment stuff, at some point we all kind of just agreed, and we all think this, that most of my life is experienced in my brain, that everything I experience I'm, I'm processing here, that I don't really have much of a body, my body's not, you know, I can't, or I can't really trust things, or even this emotional side of me, emotions are untrustworthy. The most trustworthy thing is what happens in my head, which leads to a lot of things that lead to, scientism and things like that because then at that point science which in our minds we're primarily processing through here happens that way same thing on the faith side i need to rationally prove everything and i need to get to this everything has to be rational but so much of our life is not just experienced in a rational way that's a part of who we are and it's a very integral part as we said on sunday uh, i thought very well of saying god's not asking you to turn your mind off he's not saying don't have a rational brain but if you do approach everything in life, I would argue even your approach to science is purely just what well, whatever can be rationally proven is the only thing that can be trusted. What you're ultimately doing is making yourself the authority because then you're saying, I have to know it. No one else can tell me. Well, and you're also cutting off a part of your discovery methods. Yeah. I, can't, yes. I can't use what I feel, my senses, because they aren't all... I, not you know, trustworthy. They're yeah. not trustworthy. I have I cut off some of the discovery, which science is about. It, it's a discovery method. And so we do get ourselves into this hyper individualistic state, which I think we're seeing a lot currently. And this goes back to the conversation on Sunday in people's responses to COVID, which may be seen in this anti-authority thing as well. When I become in my mind and my logic, because once again, as we've said before everyone's decision is logical and rational to them. Yes. So there is no one logic that yep. we all can just look at and go, oh, that makes sense. Everyone is logically processing it on their own. You eventually say, well, I'm the authority, which leads to a religious side. We see this on the religious side. I'm picking and choosing the things I'll follow and I'll believe and I'll trust in instead of giving myself over to God, over to Jesus, and allowing an authority outside myself to be in charge. Or you're now doing the same thing with something like science and going, well, those scientists, because they believe what I've already agreed to, I can trust them. But any data outside that, and it's why you see the kind of arguments I believe, it's why you see the arguments we see on Facebook and social media over masks and Mm -hmm. over the vaccines and every one of these kind of things is – I can't trust the authority outside. That doesn't logically, rationally make sense, as we say, to a common sense argument, as if common sense was a higher sense than any other sense. Well, everybody Uh, who says, I don't trust authority, is trusting some authority. Well, they're 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 making themselves themselves or some other body that told them, I can't trust that authority. Exactly. Yes. So anyway, and I think that part becomes dangerous on either side. If you're a more I don't trust religion and I trust science, or if you're more I don't trust science, I only trust religion, or in the end, I would argue you may only be trusting you, Mm. and that's even more dangerous, where I'm only trusting my ability to perceive, understand. Well, because the one one person that can't be fooled into thinking I am always right is me, Mm -hmm. because no one has as much evidence. Every individual is in this place. No one has as much evidence of how often you've been wrong as you do. Yeah. Right. You may not admit it to anybody else. You know. You have been wrong by the time you're a teenager. You've been wrong thousands of times. Mm -hmm. By the time you get to be my age, it's billions of times (laughs) you have been wrong. And you can act like you're not, but to trust yourself... Wow, you've been wrong so much, you wouldn't trust anybody else yeah, that was that's, wrong as much as you were. We're in an election <laughs> cycle right now, and so you're going to hear all that of, let's bring up their past record and that. If I brought your past record up to anybody that, yes. that you know of yourself, you'd go, that is an untrustworthy source. Yes. Like, Never trust that Next source. Next week, everybody would be able to say, Ed thought the Braves were going to win. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Can't I, trust him anymore. I, I have been to many money. World Series games where I thought the Braves were going to win. <laughs> yep. That's because it wasn't always a rational decision. <laughs> No, oh, it's an he emotional. Thought he was one. being rational. I felt it. I hoped it. I yeah. wanted it. It was, and you and I have said this before. I remember we had this conversation. I, I, sometimes I'm, 
I'm scared to go back and look at old sermons that I preached because oh, I have changed my way of viewing some things. I, not necessarily the core of what I said, but no. the way I would nuance things. Like I just listened to one of my favorite uh, preachers, one of our favorite scholars, Greg Boyd, uh, and he just he taught a message on Sunday. And at the end of the message, somebody they did a Q and A, and they were asking him about a book he wrote at one time, which mm-hmm. one of my favorite books he ever wrote. And he said, "Yeah, it's probably time for me to put out a volume two of that because he said I would. He said I still believe in it." But I would nuance it differently now. And I'm to the point in my life where I would appreciate that more than I do certainty. In most, because if I can be with somebody that said, yeah, I was thinking this way at one point, but I learned some things. And now I see it a little differently. And so I would, I would adjust my, my opinion yeah. of that right now. I, I, I trust that person because that's a person that's open to evidence. They're going to go where the truth lies. Well, and they're at least starting at the point that all of us who are willing to be honest know I know I don't believe exactly everything I believed five years ago. Right. Yeah. Or last year. Yeah. And if I do, that's a problem. I'm not open to any new information. I'm not open to anything new. Yeah. The world is certainly vastly different than it was this time last October. Mm-hmm. Yes. Anybody that doesn't think that, wake up, dude. Well, You've been in a coma. Everything is different in the last six months. And wherever I drew the line back on my beliefs about some things, I didn't have all the information then. Right. I don't have all the information no. today. No. And so it, I should be growing into the truth more and more every single moment. Yes. Well, because once again, going maybe this is a good little wrap-up on this question. If God, if Jesus is the truth, yes. I don't... Every day I'm learning new things about Jesus because it's a relationship. I'm growing closer to him. Mm-hmm. So my understanding of the capital T truth of Jesus, but also all the little truths of our world should also be growing and changing because I'm understanding him. I'm understanding myself and my relationship to the world and other people better. Mm-hmm. Hope I hope all the time I'm learning more about I that. I think I've told you all, I've said this at many places. About a month ago I heard a, somebody say, and it's what I now am saying like it's my own, he, somebody was saying, you, you said this, and he goes, well, I always reserve the right to get smarter. Yes. Right, yes. <laughs> yes. And he said, you're right, I did say that, mm-hmm. but I reserve the right to get smarter. Mm-hmm. I'm smarter now. I know something different <laughs> yeah. than I knew then. And that, that's been something that's frustrating. I hate to get political, but it always frustrates me in a political season when we right. always see people bringing up these past statements that people made from sometimes 40, 50 years ago, and, and they say it like, well, this is what they said. I'm, okay, they said it. I hope they think differently now, and, and from, from what I see now, they do. Yeah. And that's... That's great, yeah. you know. So I always see that as a positive when people bring up, well, he used to believe this. Okay. On every anniversary with my wife, she reminds me that when we got married, I told her, you won't have to worry about it. I will be dead by the time I'm 40. <laughs> and so she always goes, you lied. Man, I got a bad deal. You're 20 <laughs> years overdue to be gone. That's right. Uh, let's hope she doesn't, you know, <laughs> oh, I know. That. try to bring that home. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've said to all my kids, if something automatically happens quickly, have her investigate. There you That's go. That's right. <laughs> you heard it here. All right. uh, this will probably be our last question we'll have time to get to, um, but I thought we'd turn the corner because they did in the, in the talk on Sunday, and then Tim Keller did, a, I thought, a great job of, of helping us uh, see see that question, where is God in this pandemic, uh, which really always comes back to the classic question of what about pain and suffering? How do you reconcile a good God with pain and suffering? And I just thought he did an excellent, did excellent yes. job. I don't think we can do any better here. So yeah, if you didn't watch, watch that, it. you should go watch it. Yeah, go back and watch that. But I just th- thought we would give a little bit of a reaction to that, our thoughts on his take on that, um, just what you gleaned out of it, what you, what it, what it spoke to you about. I remember the first time I heard a similar response. Once again, it was when I was in college. This was one of the questions that was very difficult for me. I was in a philosophy class, and someone brings up what's Mm -hmm. referred to often as the theodicy, which is the problem of evil, right? All-powerful God, all-good God, how can there be evil and suffering? Either he's not all-powerful and he can't stop the suffering, Mm -hmm. or he's not all-good and he could stop the suffering and he just doesn't care and he doesn't do that. And 
I did not have any good answers. I mean, I probably tried two or three weeks throwing out all these, and the guy just shut them down. I didn't have it. And then I remember at the time I was listening to another uh, speaker who's been so in- instrumental, and I actually read his book, The End of Religion, the name of the book. Bruxy Cavey is the name of the guy. He's in Canada. And he gave a, a series that was on this, and his answer was so similar because he he was he's the first person I ever heard say what, now I know we've talked about Greg Boyd saying of, 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 of a of a cross-driven theology that mm-hmm. everything about Jesus is revealed at the cross and he yeah. said the answer to suffering is also found at the cross which is that in all good and all powerful God shows up at the cross and says I am taking care of evil and suffering here's what it looks like I take all the evil and suffering on the world and I put it on myself mm-hmm. and I'm going to deal with it in this way um, which I know and I so then I struggled often with the question of so then why do we have it and mm-hmm. he also gave this explanation I've heard other people give of it's very much like at the end of World War II there's you know VE Day Victory in Europe Day that's every that the war's finally done but the actual final blow of the war happened on D-Day that the war actually ended in Normandy that that's when the back is broken of the thing, and there's these there, and there were still some big battles, right? Battle of Bulge, I think. Battle of Bulge, they thought they were going to recover, and they mm-hmm. couldn't. You know, right, and, all and that. so there's all these evil forces for you know for the metaphor coming in of that are that are still at work, and the the but the the back of the enemy is broken on D Day, and there's still this stuff. And his explanation is that's what happens at the cross. the the mm-hmm. The power of evil and mm-hmm. suffering and death is broken. That's yes. D Day. It's done. Mm-hmm. There's no way that evil's going to win. Are there still forces of evil at work that are trying mm-hmm. to come back and do stuff? Mm-hmm. But by but and then there will be a v- VE day. There will be a final day where it's all taken care of and it's all done. But anyway, that w- yeah. when I heard that, to me, it really was this revelation of once again, if you go back to the cross and yep. Jesus, if you can view everything, everything I know about God, everything I know about the world is revealed at the cross. Mm-hmm. And I think it Sa- Satan and the powers that you just referred to, they've been in their death throes ever since. Yeah, that's right. And that's all that we're experiencing now. It's the it's the last guttural gasps of evil trying to stay alive and it knows it's been defeated. Mm-hmm. And it but it just won't you know, it's just it's just taking this long to kill it all. Yeah. I don't really have anything to add to that. That's exactly yeah. that's exactly right. Yep. Well, and I think to 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 the point you just made too of the final death throes, I think that's what's hard for us to see in our very small thing, you know, I hear people talk about this is the worst time anyone's ever lived through of the pandemic. Yeah. The truth is, uh, and not to minimize any of the bad things that have ever happened, sure. but th- our world is so much better able to handle these things now. Um, and and the way that things are at work, and it's hard for us to imagine 2,000 years ago how there have been ripple effects from the cross. There well, are these ripple effects that really, when you pinpoint them back, started just after the crucifixion of Jesus with this church community, things mm-hmm. like hospitals, things like our ability, every science which is birthed out of this Jesus mm-hmm. movement, all of that I see as ripple effects of, as you said, the enemies the enemies in their death throes. They yeah. don't even have all their power. They're still hurt, hurtling right. things. And, you know, when people say, is, is God sending the pandemic? What we know for sure <laughs> is that James says every good thing comes from mm-hmm. God and that these things... I see as the enemy just hurtling evil in any way that he can, and this is... But in, in lots of ways, we see there's good that still comes out of even these bad situations. Yeah, because that's the nature of God. That's right. You yes. know? So, yeah. And, and for me, it always comes down to, you know, <laughs> that it's like that statement that uh, the disciples made when Jesus says, you know, where are you guys going to go? And they said, well, we got nowhere else to go. Mm-hmm. And when I think of the, the, the question of pain and suffering, that's where I finally came down to is, and I think uh, Tim Keller said this, is he says, there is no other uh, faith system. There is no mm-hmm. other God that's been presented within the world uh, that suffers with and for his people. Um, and there's never been a God who entered into suffering, uh, until Jesus. Right. And so when what went for me, I look at the cross and I think, you know, there is the, the undeniable truth is suffering is a reality. Pain is a reality. We're all going to go through it. It's just how, what, what do you look to for your hope and your uh, explanation or your rationale for it? Mm-hmm. And it's either there is none 
or there is a there is a God and is pretty callous to it, or there's a God who who embodies it for me, and um, to me there's no option there. Yeah, I always I, I don't say always. I didn't used to say this, but it finally became clear to me. You know, pain and suffering is not a problem for Christians no. uniquely. Pain and problem suffering is a human problem. Yes. So right. Believing in God, not believing in God. I mean, if you don't believe there is a God who's good and mm-hmm. powerful mm-hmm. and the way this, you know, is set up, it doesn't suddenly make everything better. Nope. It just means now you have pain and suffering mm-hmm. and you don't have any kind of solution That's right. to it. And it's not just uniquely a Christian problem because I think uniquely for Christianity, the way Tim described it, the way I've heard other people describe it is Christianity has never said, hey, God came into the world and everything's supposed to be right. If you just follow Jesus, everything's right. right. And, and that good things won't happen to people that follow. I mean, bad things won't happen to people who follow Jesus. Yeah. Christianity, as Cord's always said, the best person that ever lived had the worst thing ever happened to them. Absolutely. Yes. So we've never gone around saying, you know, if you just do right with God, bad things won't happen. No, it's the very best person ever, Jesus, well, had there, the worst thing ever happened to them. And there are faith systems, going back to you, that do promise that. That's that if right. you live the right way, you do the right way. And there are bad uh, yeah. segments of Christianity that do that. Sure, oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, if you just have enough faith, you won't have any problems. But yeah. inevitably, all of those people eventually die, yeah. which I guess is a problem. Uh, yes, you would right. think. <laughs> and I think you're the one that I, I've heard quote this the most, so you might be able to say, I think it's Philip Yancey that says, you know, uh, what's worse than dis- being disappointed with God is being disappointed without God. Yep. Yeah, that that's right. I might be disappointed with God, but man, that's that's way better than uh, any kind of disappointment without God as yep. an answer to that. Absolutely. All right. So this coming Sunday, we start a brand new series. We already sort of alluded to it just a little yep. bit, um, but we've called it triggered. Yeah, I th- I really think, and I'll just say this for me. My hopes for this series are. I think there are a lot more of us that have uh, deeply held beliefs, feelings, <laughs> unhealed things in us yes. that cause us to have triggers that we cover over or we try to compensate for instead of deal with. I think this series has tremendous potential. Me That's too. what I'm praying for, Me that God will uh, unlock a lot of things that allow us to find some healing. Uh, I know there are a lot of people, I mean, we've been in a 19-year-old war, Mm -hmm. and so we've watched Mm -hmm. lots of soldiers come home Mm -hmm. with lots of these, and it's becoming a bigger thing for us to deal with. But it's not just soldiers. I mean, a lot of us have families of origins that left us with, you know, triggers. Mm -hmm. We have created them from ourselves for bad choices. There are triggers. I'll just say, because the three of us have been interacting with this material for weeks now, getting it ready to present to you guys, um, I have discovered so many things about myself I, yep. me too it, we have we haven't had this away. conversation among us but me yeah. as well in dealing with this material i have been helped by some of me this too. already in my own life mm-hmm. my if, wife and i are already using a lot of the language just even within our parenting because i'll say this even if i feel like i mean my family's weird but i feel like i feel like even when you talk about it I his go, family is weird i'm in it That's yeah as i say <laughs> i feel like even growing up in uh, you know in, in a fa- fairly healthy family situation i also come away with all these triggers oh, so yeah. any of us even if you don't have severe trauma or significant events in your past that you can point back and go, oh, that's the thing that triggered Mm me. All of us have these things, and my wife and I now use them a lot in in, when we're talking about how to deal with our girls and how to deal with situations, because I think every parent can understand, and I think we were having this conversation at a different time, but when a a four-year-old can get you so angry, Mm. you go, this little tiny person should not be... Every parent knows what that experience is like. That's being true. What's wrong with me? (laughs) Right, yeah. there's something. It's not this wrong? four. No, this four year old is because, and you've all had that. And because yeah. I found myself saying it, you almost you don't laugh because you're so angry in the situation. Yeah. You go, "Why are you acting like such a child?" And then you go, "Because you're the child, and then you're the acting child. the way yes. that's appropriate for you yes. to act. Yes. I'm not acting the way that yes. I am acting like a child." So anyway, all that to say, 
And yes. I took m- my four girls mini golfing this weekend, and I was very triggered. <laughs> if you've ever taken it, taken four kids under the age of eight mini golfing, right. you also have been so triggered. So why don't you so. hang on to that? We'll talk about it next there week. There you go. Because we're going to talk about triggers next week That's right. when we present yeah. the first week this I, coming Sunday. I, I hope you'll all turn it, tune yeah. in. I also hope either online or in person, because you can invite people to either place. Yes. yes. You will help us get this material. Lots of us in the world. Mm. Uh, need this whether you believe in God or not and this is material that can help you we're going to certainly show you how it Jesus and the, the writers of scripture talk about it yes, yes. so yep. we're going to make that clear but this is really good stuff that lots of people need absolutely yep. so I'm going to cut it off right there because yeah. we're done and number two uh, it's almost time for first pitch <laughs> well there we go so uh, we'll see you next week <laughs>